and welcome to the Amber Spycast, your one-stop shop for all things His Dark Materials. Uh, I'm Alaric, and joining me are Joanna and Travis. Uh, we are diving back into the Golden Compass, and I'd love to start, as usual, with Joanna's breakdown. Hit it. All right, here we go. So in chapters 12 and 13, the expedition takes a short break on their journey north, and John Fa asks Lyra to check the alethiometer and asks more about how Baldanger is being defended. Lyra tells him it is just as the witch's demon said, that it is being defended by a company of Tartars, and they do not expect anyone to attack. As she relays the message, Lyra tells Lord Fa that the alethiometer is telling her something else. In the next valley, there is a village by a lake that is being troubled by a ghost, perhaps even the ghost of a child. John Fa is dismissive of Lyra, more concerned about storming Bolvanger than investigating the possibility of a ghost. But Lyra does not give up so easily and slips away to talk to Yorick. She convinces Yorick to take her to the village in the next valley and gets permission from Lord Fa to do so. Lyra is filled with wild exhilaration as she rides in armored bear. Traveling on low ridges and outcrops of black rock, Lyra and Yorick look to the skies and see hundreds of witches flying towards the north. They encounter a man at the edge of the village, and Yorick tells him they're looking for a child. The man asks if they've come to take the child away because the people are afraid of it. Further on, another man tells them that it is not the only child of its kind and that he has seen others in the forest. When Lyra and Yorick finally enter the fish house where the child is hiding, they find a young boy named Tony Makarios huddled in the corner, desperately clutching a piece of dead fish to his chest. The gobblers had cut away the boy's demon and created a severed child. Yorick and Lyra bring Tony back to the Egyptian camp where he dies shortly after. They begin traveling once again. Lyra's mind is frenzied with thought about gobblers and dust, little Tony Makarios, the spy fly, and Yorick Bernison, and she falls asleep as they draw closer and closer to Bolvanger. This one was a tough read for me, guys. Oh, the worst. Um, you know, it, and let me just tell you a little anecdote. Let me dive into this with an anecdote. So my mom is a uh, not a fan of this book series. She really struggled. She said it starts off well, and then it became sickening to her. And I believe as I read this chapter, these two chapters, I feel like this is where it turned for her, where it became too upsetting to read. And it's, it, it is one of those bits of writing that Pullman gets so right and he's laid the groundwork for what a demon is and how important it is to the humans. And the rules are so well-defined now already, just halfway through this book, that the way that this plays out really makes you, like, I was short of breath and I was welling up in tears and it's a lot. It's, it's a lot. and. And he plays it perfectly. I'm not going to say he milks it, but he allows the suspense to build and to build before he reveals to you what's in there. And part of what makes that suspense so, so palpable is Pan's reaction as they're, as they're moving towards the, the, the fish house. And I think that's the, the first sense we get, true sense we get of how frightening this might, must really be. Um, you know, the villagers may just be, you know, they're kind of like, they're just kind of hiding. Um, you know, they come out kind of defensive with rifles or kind of grumpy or whatever. And, mm -hmm, yeah. and so I think you can kind of play that off as like, they're just annoyed that this child is here. But once Pan starts to freak out, it, I think it really starts to hit home that something is really, truly wrong. And that's where, you know, that masterful suspense starts to build, um, and then he hits you with a wallop. Yeah. Yeah, there's a real emotional wallop. And that, you know, they, they've never seen this before. They've, this is something that is very foreign to them. Um, and they haven't seen the witches yet, really, either. Uh, just just talk of, well, I mean, I guess they did, they did talk pretty, we sort of learned about how the witches work with their demons. But this was different because mm -hmm. Tony was 
broken. He was emaciated. He was um, uh, confused and lost. Um, he was a half half of a child. Yeah, and the description is, you know, it's graphic. And I, and, and I think he makes it graphic like that because we, we, outside of this world, have no idea how that could be. Um, but in that first paragraph, um, after they find him, they said her first impulse was to turn and run or to be sick. A human being with no demon was like someone without a face or with their ribs laid open and their heart torn out. Something unnatural and uncanny that belonged to the world of night guests, not the waking world of sense. And I, I love that because mm -hmm. it just makes it this, it's like a horror show. You know, it's like a horror show. Yeah, someone without a face. I mean, just think about what that, that evocative image is and, and how that makes you feel and makes your, yeah, it, make, it made me tighten my chest. Like it was very, it was a lot. Um, she is... She and Pan show a lot, you know, they're, they're feeling the same emotion and the same, they're both so scared and Lyra is very scared and we know how scared she is. Pan is manifesting it by, you know, running back and forth and, and not wanting her to go in and she's stealing herself, even though she's just as afraid, she steals herself to go in because she has to know. She has a, she, she has to know what's behind that door, well, even though just... she's terrified. You know, back to the the thing about the face. Don't just think about how it makes you feel. Think about the the practicalities of what a face does. You know, a face communicates what you're what you're trying to say, who you are. Basically, you know, your face is your your face is, you know, to use the cliche about the eyes. You know, it's your windows to the world. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's gone. Like this boy has no connection, not just to his soul, but has no connection to the greater world. Mm -hmm. You know, for all intents and purposes, he may as well be dead. And I, I just, I, you know, the the whole ghostly child thing. I don't think that that was a metaphor or anyone, um, you know, just trying to describe what they think that they saw. I mean, for all intents and purposes, a person without a uh, a demon is, you know, you're 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 talking about a zombie or something like just wandering around, something horrible. Yeah, a walking, yeah. you know, a walking dead, even though they're, you know, he's still barely alive. Right. Um, he, uh, the, the way that he's, he's described is, is upsetting, but he, um, how did he end up there? Did, you know, did he leave Bolvanger? Did he escape? Are they letting them leave? You know, it sounds like there's more of them in the woods. What, what how did he end up there? I, I don't think we know, but what do you guys think? We don't. I mean, I just imagine this, this poor boy just wandering across the frozen tundra by himself looking for his ratter, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it, you know, to, like I, I tend to do the analogy to, to uh, another, you know, nerdy show years ago when I first introduced uh, my older daughter to Dr. Who, you know, we watched all of the David Tennant seasons. I'm sorry, the Chris Eccleston seasons and season. And, uh, you know, we got to the, um, the one with the boy with the gas mask. Mm -hmm. Are you my mummy? Mm -hmm. Right. That terrified her for years, mm -hmm. for years. I, I thought it was going to scare her away from the franchise. Um, happily, it didn't. But um, that was what I envisioned as I'm reading this. That's kind of what I felt was that same isolated child, that voice just repeating, you know, where's my ratter? You know, mm. where's my ratter over and over again? And uh yeah, it's I'm not I don't live in that world, obviously, so I don't understand the full horror of seeing a, um, a severed child. But gosh darn it, the um, I feel like that's I, I got a taste of it mm -hmm. just just reading this. It, it was it was horrific. She's so she really tries to comfort him quickly. Once she steals herself, she goes into she changes her her outward tone and she 
really tries to take care of him and care for him and comfort him as best she can. And, and, and Pan follows suit with a desire to comfort him, even though Pan is not really allowed to comfort him because of the demon great, code. The great taboo. Yes. Yeah. Um, but his desire to comfort him was strong. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, one thing that kind of got me through it a little bit is I it kept picturing Peter Pettigrew as his his demon, and I thought that that helped a little bit um, mm-hmm. because wasn't his wasn't that a rat too? It was, but scabbers, I believe. Yes, not scabbers. not ratters, but I was yeah. sort of pic- picturing a yeah. little Peter Pettigrew in there. Poor little Ron Weasley. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now I'm going to picture a severed Ron Weasley, and that's just horrific. Thanks, Alaric. Oh, oh God, goodness, cool. terrible! See, see what you did oh, to me. Fan, fanfic strikes again. <laughs> <laughs> so she. She um, one thing that made me sort of you know incensed is you're 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 going through this with her and and she's leaving the village and this damn villager comes out and it's like hey you got to pay me for that fish and I was like are you serious and then her reaction was my same reaction where she was like I almost said she was almost gonna have Yurik just kill him that right there on the mm-hmm. spot <laughs> <laughs> right. and he probably would have yeah yeah. Uh, it, so she she loads up Tony and she climbs a, a, on top of Yurik. I love a lot of Yurik in this the, these pages because of I love him translating for her. I really th- that you're sort of mm-hmm. feeling that his intelligence is sort of coming through more and more. Um, his patience and his intelligence and his not his 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 worldliness and what he knows and how he can teach her. He's not just a tool mm-hmm. um, for this quest, but he is going to be an important part of her life now, and he's willing to talk to her. Um, you know, I, I I love some of the imagery of him. You know, she's she puts Tony on Yurik's back, and then she says, "You know, can I get on too? Will you be okay?" And he's like, "You know, I can carry two kids. You know, my armor is super heavy. Hop on." Um, how he. Uh, He's sort of unified. He, there's a unified front. The two of them have a unified front when they return to the the camp, and how when they arrive back, and the Egyptians are sort of horrified by Tony, he dresses them down, and he says, "Shame on you! Think what this child has done. You might not have more courage, but you should be ashamed to show less." He's pissed. Mm-hmm. He's mm-hmm. he's already really um, yeah they're 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 becoming pretty tight you know she even has they they spar a little bit and he's like hey go ahead uh, try to you know try to hit me if you want to hit me hit me <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> to pull a little mat- matrix co- quote out <laughs> um, and she you know she can't he's like just casually like flicking her away this the description of his paw and how her hand is the same size as one of his claws mm-hmm. and and the mm-hmm. the the leathery armor of his, the pads on the bottom of his feet and the power that he wields. And he appears to be able to be very gentle with her and careful with her. Um, I, I really love where Yurik's character is going and how their relationship is is blossoming. I love the hints that we're getting at to where his character has been too. Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, before he ended up in that village, I mean, like you said, the translation, all the, the little bits of wisdom, the fact that he knows that he can carry two children and it suggests that he's done this before, you know, and then the references to the Tunguska campaign, more of those. I mean, he lived a really rich life prior to that village and and you just have to think whatever led him there which no doubt we'll find out sooner rather than later had to have been terrible yeah they uh you know she even compares Azriel to him a little bit because mm-hmm. Azriel struck down someone and killed them was stri- stripped of their wealth and their mm-hmm. title right. and Yurik was as well they're familiar in that way um and you know she's she's feeling more and more connected to him because of those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did you feel about her reaction to um, the missing piece of fish after Tony had passed away? Oh God, that was all. That was the worst part for me. That was the absolute worst part for me. Um, 
because she had she had taken in that boy's he couldn't feel the pain anymore and she decided to do it for him and uh, you know i i just thought that that was uh that was painful uh it was powerful writing my gosh it, it was really powerful and it was a really powerful moment for lyra as a uh, as a character yeah we're we're we earlier um yorick kind of steps up and puts you know these men in their place for kind of you know not either not treating Lyra with the respect or not you know doing things the way that they they should have she just straight out calls all of these men like to task where is this piece of fish and at first you know they're, they're I, I, and I you know I'm, I, I guess rightfully so they didn't they didn't see him clutching it the way she did in the fish house mm -hmm. so you know so they didn't experience that desperation he had the petting of it, the, the you know, the, the the clutching to his heart, um, you know. By the time they encounter him, he is pretty much inert, like mm -hmm. he's you know he's out, and so they didn't realize that, and it was an honest mistake for sure. Um, and so at some point they kind of like try to laugh it off, like she's like, "Where's this fish?" And they're like, "Well, you know." Well, it's... And when they realize, um, you know, the extent to which she is getting upset, when they realize, you know, the mistake that they made. They feel really bad. The guy's like, mm -hmm. I'm, really, I'm really sorry. Like, I gave it to my dog. I didn't know. And she is just livid, you know, righteously indignant. Mm -hmm. um, and rightfully so. It's all he had. It's all he had yeah. at that moment. That's all he had. It, it, that fish comforted him at, at, at the little amount that it did. It comforted him. And, you know, I can't even... And I'm, I'm thinking, putting myself in, in Bullman's shoes and putting myself in, a, in uh, a speculative fiction writer's shoes for a moment. And everything in science fiction and spe speculative fiction, fantasy, any of it, has a real life allegory. You know, you can map almost one to one something in speculative fiction that um, is has a real life counterpart. I can't think of a situation that is like this you know i mean you can you can look at people with missing limbs that kind of thing but at the end of the day you know that's still something physical something you can still move through the world without i, I mean not to slight the, the the trauma that people go through when they they lose limbs things things along those lines but um this boy lost his soul and I, I, you know the closest thing i could think of was was um you know losing a twin losing their twin oh yeah um mm -hmm. would maybe would be the closest especially if they were close depending on uh, how old they were yeah um but 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 even even that they're they're separate entities you know mm -hmm. they're they're not the same person mm -hmm. um this is a, a gaping hole inside of him yeah yeah, I'm just so overwhelmed by Pullman's ability to write something that, again, has no real life counterpart. Mm -hmm. A pain that has no real life counterpart. He and can't yeah, feel that. Right. Uh, yeah, but we can because of right. his writing. Like, we mm -hmm. totally get it because of his writing. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I was, you know. I, I, I say that like you know there's passages in these in these books that I know that like you know make me are gonna make me cry but you know I, I kind of forgot about this I remember it being emotional and upsetting but there's three or four passages in this in just this description alone that sort of you you feel that that you know your throat getting tight and your eyes getting you know a little dusty in the room you know mm -hmm. your eyes start to water um, you, you feel so much you feel so much of his pain because of the way it's described. Um, and then how that, how it all plays out over the next few pages and, and how, she, you know, Lyra deals with it and how, um, how careful and, and comforting she is to him in his, you know, the few hours he has left alive. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, he doesn't last the night. He's, she finds him at the very end of his life. He's barely holding it together. Um, you know, was, was he able to sort of feel some release because he was found and comforted and he was able to die? Um, or was he just so broken by the time they found him that he expired? He was just, he, he was spent. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, I didn't read these these chapters. I listened to them on the audiobook as I was remodeling my office this weekend. And uh, one, it literally was dusty in my office. So <laughs> I qu- wasn't quite sure whether or not I felt it or my eyes did. <laughs> but um, well, then I realized my eyes did. But uh, number two, um, I didn't think he was going to die. I really didn't. No. You know, when when she found him and brought him back, I was convinced that she'd rescued him and he he'd be able to regain some form of life, some sort of life. I did not think he was going to die. And when he did, it it was a surprise. It it hit hard. It really did. And I, I you know, I, I'm I'm sure that's how how Lyra felt, too, you know. Like she'd saved him. Why wasn't he alive? It it drives home what they're doing at Balvanger and mm-hmm. how diabolical it is. And not only are they, you know, this intercision that they're doing is immoral and and against this code. Um, it 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 ki- literally kills the children. They're mm-hmm. killing the children. It's not just oh we're 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 cutting away the demon and for whatever reason and. You know the kids. You know they'll just live next to each other. They won't be connected in the same way and whatever. No, this this is literally killing children. They're killing mm-hmm. children. Right. Mm-hmm. And and they are literally letting them. They those children aren't escaping. They're, yeah, just they're mostly I, letting them out to they, die. They are the literally cold. just letting like they're right. There's it's you know this place is guarded by Tartars. There's wires and all these things. It's not like these children are. They're just like we're done with you. Go and you know die somewhere in the woods. Yeah. And, you know, and just the fact, and and the and the villagers knew this, and I think this is one of the reasons they were scared of him. Not necessarily because they have seen other children like him, but none of them lasted this long. And mm-hmm. I think that was part of what freaked them out. Was like they were like, this one's strong, mm-hmm. and and I think that was you know, and so I think, you know, and again, Lyra had no reason to believe, like you think thought Travis, like well, like I have him now. We can help him. Right. Um, but to the villagers, it was kind of like what was scaring them was that he wasn't dead yet, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, and that was the bigger that was the bigger issue. But yeah, just the fact that they're not only are they doing this, but then just callously letting them out the back door and don't let it hit you on the way out. That countryside right. is probably littered with the bodies of, of children. Oh, absolutely. Wearing secondhand coats and mm-hmm. pants and boots, which mm-hmm. are confiscated from maybe other children that they've stolen. And they just this they put them on them and just set them out into the world. Yeah. It would be it would be more of a mercy to just kill them mm-hmm. on the right. spot. Mm-hmm. Right. And instead they're letting them freeze to death alone, more alone than they've ever felt their entire life in the cold with no demon. Yeah. And and I think we've heard this phrase before and I won't give it any more context than this, but it's like cruelty is the point. Mhm. Cruelty is the point. Like it, it it's it's not just you know, it, it's more than just can we do this and what happens after. Do, do you know what I mean? It, yeah. It, being cruel and and inflicting more pain is the point and it's just nauseating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because those kids are no lo- no longer people to them. Right. They're just they're they're husks. They're they're not they're less than nothing. The, um, yeah. They're they're giving them the death sentence, but also they're they're discarding them. They're throwing them mm-hmm. away. It, mm-hmm. It's it's so impersonal and and yeah. The, 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 there's a lot to be said about how these children are dealt with after this intercision. Mm-hmm. I mean, do they think they're helping them? Do, do you know what I mean? Like, are, is it that they're trying to perfect this process? Um. And so they're just going to keep doing it until they find a way to do it without the child dying. Kill, killing the demon right. and killing and the kill, child. Right. Like, like. I don't think that the children, I think the children are totally secondary to this. Whatever their goal is, the end goal of intercision and cutting the, the, the demon off of the child is the goal. The, the, the children are just, you know, the eggs that are broken on the way to the omelet. Yeah. Mm. Their, their collateral damage mm-hmm. for what this, whatever this scientific process is and mm-hmm. what it's for, um, they don't care because what they're getting out of it is is during the process, not afterwards. Right. 
But what this all does for me, and uh, and I think for any of the readers, is reinforce that the the Egyptians are number one, the good guys in mm-hmm. this story. Mm-hmm. I mean, as long as you're not that, you are the good guy in this story. Right. Mm-hmm. You're, you know, they're they're going to go and fight, and they're after seeing this, you know, I feel like they they've got steel in their gut. They're mm-hmm. they've seen what they're doing. It's confirmed, and they're not going to stand idly by and let this happen anymore. Right. It was just words and platitudes and and discussion and topics, and now it's real. Yeah, they're not just getting the kids back; they're saving them from that. Yes. Right. Um, the you know we could I mean, honestly we could probably talk the whole episode about about this, but you know whenever. Um, they, uh, she uses the lithiometer quite a bit here, and she's learning a little bit more about the symbols. She was struggling to read some of the symbols and knowing how it how it's used. Uh, but there was one thing that I was thinking about. She um, she was unsure about. Uh, she couldn't remember what it was that. Um, the new king of the Panzer Bjorn, what it was that she remembered in the conversation that she overheard at at Jordan College. Mm-hmm. She remembers almost everything about it um, when when he's mentioned again, and when Yurik's talking about what's happening at at uh, in the Panzer Bjorn um, home. Uh, can she use the alethiometer to remember those things? Could she assign symbols to to help retrace her own steps and remember things from the past. I mean, I w- I would think so. I think I would think it would it would be like asking it any other kind of question, um, whether it was something she's experienced directly or something that she's just trying to glean, you know. Otherwise, I I think you know I don't know how that's different than where is Mrs. Coulter. Um, because it feels to me like part of it is really is almost like the desire to know it, like is part of what fuels being able to mm-hmm. find the answer. So, you know, maybe if she was really, you know, if she's really focusing on this question and was really, she would be able to maybe get that answer from from the alethiometer. But mm. but that's, I mean, I'm totally speculating. I don't know. And that like she sees the witches, all the witches flying overhead, which is a great, another great yeah. image from this, which is like, whoa, um, yeah. she could, you know, I believe she could ask the alethiometer where they're headed. Are they going to attack? Mm-hmm. Um, are they on our side? Are they at another side? Um, mm-hmm. But she doesn't. And she's all, she's very busy at the time. So, it, you know, I don't blame her for not looking that up. But she, uh, you know, I, I'm just curious to know, like, when she can use it. And, and does she need to be? Maybe You know, you're, you're absolutely right. Maybe that's it, Joanna, is that she has to have a real, like, desire um, and she has to have a focused thought about whatever it is that she's trying to find out. So speaking of the witches, by the way, can I tell you how my little heartstring was tugged when she was talking to Farter Corum and they were talking about the witches and she said, what are we going to do about them witches, Farter Corum? She said, I wonder if your witch was one of them. And he says, my witch, I wouldn't presume that far, Lyra. And I just was like, my little heart. So great. Like she's just like, what about your witch? And he was like, well, yeah, I like that too. Oh, it was just sweet. It was a sweet moment in what is literally just like the most crushing two chapters of. <laughs> it's just, it's such a downer. God, this yeah. thing is just so harsh. So harsh. So, um, I, I was, she's, Lyra's clever and we're, we were made aware of it many times, but this, her thinking of using the spy fly as a decoy that would look somewhat like her alethiometer is very much thinking ahead for what she might be coming up upon in the next couple days. She seems to be aware of the value of the alethiometer and that other people want it. We, we know that she knows that other people want it. She 
takes care of it. She keeps it on herself. She doesn't leave it anywhere. So we know that she knows that it's important. But this is a very clever use of this spy fly. Oh, I mean, it's ingenious. And I'm just like, Lyra makes me feel really stupid. Like, <laughs> if, I was, if it was 11-year-old Joanna, I would probably be distracted by, like, the iceberg. And she is here, like, making these, you know split second you know very um you know, like i wouldn't even have remembered i would have heard it and then re and forgot totally that this thing would attack and kill the mm. first thing it saw if mm -hmm. it escaped like i wouldn't yes. have remembered that piece of information right and yet she does and and this is something that we were we were talking about a little bit alec and i want to bring it up again because i think it's so important you know how pullman crafts lyra as an intelligent child but still a child is just, it's just pure genius. Like mm -hmm. he gives her these special, you know, chosen one or not, he gives her these qualities that are so amazing. And he tempers it with her age, her immaturity, her childishness, you know, her her lack of focus and her, you know, short temper and, and all of these things. And she is such a a believable character where I feel like if somebody else was writing her, I wouldn't believe that they could do the things that they're doing. And yet when I read her, I believe that she is capable of every single thing he says she's capable of doing. Well, she's been training her entire life for this, right? I mean, all the wars that she, that they've pretended to have yeah. at uh, Jordan College and all the shifting alliances they have. I mean, her entire young life has been pretending at this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she's kind of been thrown into a real live version of basically the games that she's been playing. It's uh, it's kind of neat because, um, you know, like you said, with a, a lesser writer, she would be dancing on the edge of the Mary Sue, mm -hmm. you know. But yeah. with uh, Pullman, I mean, he gives her all the uh, re the requisite flaws that an eleven year old has, and uh, he establishes where she gets this skill set. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's not just something that just happened to make her the 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 perfect character in plot armor. She is a well crafted character, like you said. It's uh, pretty amazing. She's brave, and many characters could be brave when someone's writing them, but she's brave in in only the way a kid can be brave. Like you know, they kids can feel invincible in a way that adults can't. And she can stand up to an armored bear and sort of look them in the eye and be afraid. But it's like, eh, what's he going to do to me? Why does he even care? She's, she stands up to people around her. She, you know, she's impetuous and she talks back, but she's, she's forward and she's, she's quick thinking and she's quick witted and, but she's still silly and mm -hmm. she, she speaks in a funny way sometimes and, uh, you know, a way that a kid might look at a certain thing. Um, and when it, it's, it's very apparent when Yurik's talking to her about his experience and how, how little experience that she has in comparison. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, uh, sorry, the, uh, I was just thinking when you were describing other characters like this, you know, Katniss Everdeen, that character owes a lot to the way this, even though she's a little bit older, um, the way that I sort of saw that if if I was going to be writing a Hunger Games trilogy and I wanted to have a lead character that was going to be a young woman, I would go to this book and steal everything that Philip Pullman put in this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's or she's everything like you wish that a uh, Ray from Star Wars would be. Mm. You know? I like Ray, but yeah. I like Ray too, but she's no Lyra. No. She's too old. <laughs> well, <Yes. yeah. laughs> and Lyra doesn't have a droid. Yeah. And but I she think does I, have Pan. <sighs> she does have Pan. And I think Lyra's greatest strength is that she has yet to find her limits. Like, she has, she still believes that anything is possible. And that's, I think, where so much of her strength and so much of that power and so much of that confidence comes because that's how we all were when we were, you know, only as an adult do we start to limit our, we limit ourselves by what mm -hmm. we think we can and cannot do. And she is 
in this, you know, in the total realm of I can do whatever I put my mind to, which is just pure, that's a pure kid thought, mm -hmm. um, but it's perfect. Mm -hmm. And it's what I think allows her to pull off so many of the things that she does where as an adult, I'm going, I would never have done that. And she does it naturally because mm -hmm. she doesn't limit herself. Um, so, yeah. But you know, she's noticed she's ter she has, she has no physical fear. Like we've, 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 we can all agree on the fact that she is not afraid of anything potentially physically hurting her, but she can get that terror when it comes to, uh, the, the existential threats to pan and her relationship to pan. Sure. Oh gosh. That is so deep. I mean, the, the, the bit that we talked about last week, uh, with the fence and the, the stretching, I mean, you know, we can go from her standing in front of a giant armored polar bear and being willing to take a SWAT. But, you know, when, when, when her demon gets more than what, three or four meters or something away, just terrified. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, everything leading up to the, to the discovery of Tony terror, you mm -hmm. know, and pan felt that mm -hmm. it's uh, and then the, the bit with the, with the monkey, you know, it's uh, anything that, uh, can can hurt her um I'm, I'm trying to think of what is what is the term for that kind of uh threat i mean an existential threat would be a threat to her entire existence i'm just trying to think of, of an um, um, an emotional threat maybe uh, an emotional threat really really gets at her Yeah, I have, we'll have to look up. I, yeah, you're right. I, I, there's there's definitely a word for it. I just don't know what that word is. But you're right. There's there's a something a little bit sm a, like thirty percent smaller than existential. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's 30%. a German word for it. Yes, the Germans definitely have a word for it. <laughs> oh God, yeah, it probably sounds like. <laughs> 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 uh, no offense to our German listeners. Um, I love the German language. Um, the uh, I we got to hear a little bit more about the uh, the Tartars and the holes in the head, and what that might be, and uh, being able to speak to God because of having a direct access port to their brains. Um, that's kind of wild, right? What is that called? Trepanation? Is that what that is? Trepanning, yeah. Trepanning. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was interesting, and then it sort of changes the narrative of what happened to Grumman and his team, and maybe it wasn't even Grumman that they saw on that table, that head. So Yurik's like, oh, was it really him? And she's like, well, actually, I don't know. And they're like, he, they don't scalp their friends. And he had been essentially adopted by them, mm -hmm. which I thought that was kind of an interesting little twist. Well, it was also great because then at least it's Lee Scoresby, and he's saying, well, oh, right. your father was trying to get money, right? <laughs> <laughs> like he was probably using a scare tactic, and and I love the the you know he's like nobody's gonna look that closely right. at something like that anyway. So he was just kind of like, you know, hedging yeah, he, his bet. Yeah, he said, did did he get the money? She's like, yeah. He's like, eh, yeah. It was a good play. He's like, good play. That was a good call. Good play, yeah. Asriel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so whose head was that? It could have been anybody. Random Tartar's head. Well, you know, that's the thing. Is is that was the piece of information where it's like, well, if they had this hole drilled in their head, that was, a, he had been essentially accepted into the Tartars culture or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so the Tartars probably didn't kill him. Right. So it was just made to look like to these guys sitting in a room that didn't want to get too close to the head and really mm -hmm. examine it or kind of grossed out by it. It was to make them think, you know, to gin up what, was happening um, in the North and to get this cash money, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, does that mean Grumman is still alive? Um, is he living with the Tartars? Does it change our view of what the Tartars are? Yeah. Cause we thought, I was thought they were just villains, you know, up to yeah. this point. I'm like, but now there's, there's a wrinkle. They're not quite 100% villains. Mm -hmm. It was kind of weird. They, they sew the little flap of skin back over the hole. Right. You know, yeah, gross. a little body horror is pretty gross. There is no organization that I can think of, including my own family, that I would w let myself get a hole drilled in my head to join. 
That's you a know? hard pass. Yeah. That is like, a yeah. hard pass. It's the worst kind of hazing. Yeah, absolutely. Oh like, yeah. no thanks. Welcome to yeah. Tartar Fi Fi Tartar. <laughs> We're gonna <laughs> drill a hole in your skull. Yeah. yeah nope. Turn around, leave through the fr the front entrance, <laughs> exit through the gift shop, and be done. <laughs> Welcome to the X Men, Kitty Pride. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was interesting. You know, Lee Lee is in this just a little bit, but you, you know, you you guys were right, to, and Joanna, you're right to point that out. That uh, uh, he had, yeah, he's got a he had a little uh, interesting piece of information, and mm -hmm. uh, he he also is, um, sees Lyra as someone that he can be straightforward and honest with. When she asks, he talks. He doesn't care. Um, and I loved the description of him rescuing Yurik and how he has to gas up his his balloon again mm -hmm. and how he does that it was it was not overdone but everything we needed to know about how that thing works was bundled into three paragraphs and yeah. i got it and right. i loved the sort of the mental picture of he had to sort of fly around he saw where he was he had to sort of analyze the situation and then they went down and rescued him and that's how we know how much he can carry in that balloon right which can is you carry I... a uric right and I feel like we learned everything we learned we need to know about Lee Scorsby's character in that description. Yeah. You know? And also, I really want to learn how to make hydrogen now. And if my house ever explodes, you'll know it's because I tried the hydrogen um, creation experiment from this book. Children listening, do not try the hydrogen creation experiment. Do not do attempt not this do. at home. Do that not attempt that at home. That Travis would be stupid. You want to make a bathtub hydrogen? <laughs> <laughs> I'm making my own fuel cell. Uh, well, and I, and I think just what I love about that too, and you said it was everything we needed to know we learned um, in that short amount of time. And, and part of that to me is, again, this excellent character crafting that Pullman does. Um, I said last week that it isn't the, the physical description of... Um, of Lee Scoresby that's going to do it for me on whether or not I can accept, you know, Lynn manuel um, as, as that character, but it's going to be this, the, the way that, you know, does he have the swagger? Does he have the mannerisms? Does he have these characterizations? And that pithiness mm -hmm. is so typical. Like my husband and Travis, you know, this for sure is the pithy, like he will, he will say, I am verbose as everybody can tell. Mm -hmm. And my husband will say what he can say in like, the shortest way possible. Yeah. He does. You and you know, actually, yeah. I yeah. actually, I decided uh, over the course of, the re of uh, these two chapters that uh, Lee scores me in my head until we see Lynn manuel Miranda is going to be your, your husband. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's excellent. He will be so, very happy to know that. Just wanted you to know. I appreciate that. Now I'm going to have to picture that as well. Thanks, Travis. <laughs> I already see his mug every day. <laughs> now I'm going to see it when I read this book. <laughs> My work here is done. <laughs> but I also love how much we learned about Yorick, and I can't believe we didn't talk about, oh my God, why Yorick is not in Svarbard. Not what I thought. Can I just say that that was not the reason that I thought he was going to be like locked up in some town and had lost his armor and was all drunked up. Mm -hmm. Like I was expecting this like, noble kind of stand and homeboy just like killed somebody he lost his temper yeah he wasn't able to control his temper no and that's it that's it and there's a they're very strict and their rules are uh they don't they don't uh trifle with uh, people that no matter who you are no. um who break the rules mm -hmm. right and then and then he pulls like a captain raymond holt from nice. and he's like well i deserved it you know like this is like flat out like he was just like well you know i mean i deserved what i got that was appropriate and i was like what is going on Svalbard uh, seems in, guy. it seems impenetrable to me the, the way it's described it's like you know leave azrael you're not going to get azrael mm -hmm. don't even bother going there i don't know what you're you think you're going to do but don't do it Stick with the mission, stick with what you're doing now, and stay away from Svalbard. You're not going to get in there. Yurik doesn't even want to go back. No, and for as Except... oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say, and for as powerful okay. as he is, Lee Scoresby says he steps one foot in there, he's dead anyway. So. Yeah. You're going, going to kill him right away. Right. But um, you got to think about it, though. He is a bear killing bear. 
and the rest of the bears are not bear killing bears and it gives him an advantage over the re- over you know his countrymen mm-hmm. um though part of me also thinks does does he need to be does lord osriel need to be rescued i mean when the the way he he's going to be treated according to, to uh you know he'll probably even have his own servant which if you think about it he will have a servant who is a giant armored bear just throwing that out there that's amazing mm-hmm. talk about white collar prison right <laughs> he's, gonna, I mean, he's gonna have you know his own servant oh you know, giant armored bear bring me a drink i just uh, don't believe it though I, like i mm-hmm. listening to that like oh you know he's being taken care of he's noble and whatever i just don't buy it He's he's living among a bunch of bears who don't appear to need a lot of creature comforts. You know, Yurik's just laying in the snow and, and tearing at a deer leg, a frozen deer leg or a reindeer leg. Um, do we think that somebody's like making hot tea and nice stuff for Azrael in the in like the farthest reaches of the north? But the bears know what the humans need. But like you know, they've had a lot of dealings with the humans. I, I, I'm sure if they're they've got a VIP section for captain, they're uh, yeah. gonna have uh, you know a bed, uh, a cook on hand. No, um, I don't know. I don't know. I hope the little trails be treated well. I like him. Yeah, I hope so. But it was like, oh man, I, I just can't. I can't imagine that. You know, as as deft as they are with their claws and metalworking. It's like yeah, I can't imagine them making a, you know, a biscotti and some, uh, you know, n- nice vittles. Right. Would you like me to decant that toke, sir? <laughs> I don't think so. They just give they just give him a glass of blood. That's, right. That's their toke. Here. Uh, any other uh, bits of uh, info in here that you guys want to chit chat about? Um. I don't think so. I think we, we kind of beat up, uh, not beat up. I think we, we've uh, pretty closely uh, discussed those two hard chapters Yikes. that yeah. um, I would like to um, entitle between the two of them why we fight. Because, gosh, if uh, there was ever any way to, uh, to to reiterate why the Egyptians are doing what they're doing, this these two chapters are it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, um, that is it for this episode. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, we have our lovely website, theamberspycast.com. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter and Instagram um, to varying degrees. Uh, we're all making wincing faces. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we're out there for you guys to look for. Please reach out. Send us some feedback. Feedback at theamberspycast.com. Still love to see some of that. You can also send us messages on the Facebook uh, page as well. Um, this, has been, this has been a lot of fun. And this, uh, I'm, I'm just loving this reread, guys. I'm so happy to be with you guys and read this together. And you got, you're opening my eyes to stuff that I'm missing. And, and I just love this experience so far. Now that we're officially halfway through this book, um, it's just great when we meet up and chat. Oh, agreed. This is this is a highlight of my week. Um, I'm looking forward to when we finally get a drop date for this series because I need to be counting down. Like I I, I have all mm-hmm. this frenetic energy and I don't know how to direct it and I need a date. So hopefully they will give that to us soon. But um, this is this is really fun and I'm enjoying being able to look at his work and, and give it some of the recognition I think it deserves. I know it, it gets a lot of praise, but I'm glad we're able to look at it. Um, it's it's like closely. it's praised and it's people like it. But Philip Pullman on Facebook only has 50,000 likes. And that to me is way too low. Way too low. Wow. Way too low. Oh my goodness! Uh, you know, J.K. Rowling has like a gaz- tr- every person on the planet right. has liked her page. Um, Pullman is is a little too far down, in my opinion. I think that the series, when it pops, I'm hoping that not only do people pick up the books and read them like they did with George R. R. Martin, mm-hmm. um, and like you know, shoots them into the stratosphere, uh, but it d- and deservedly so. Uh, it's an exciting book, and it's 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 exciting fiction, and the prose is poetry. 
Um, mm-hmm. Some of this, some of this stuff is so good that uh, you, I, you know, I can't wait for other people to experience it. And you know, we were talking before we started recording about um, these chapters and how they would de- be dealt with in the show. And man, wouldn't wouldn't these two chapters, these l- small, this little bit, wouldn't it be so great for that to be its own episode? Really live in this. I don't want. I almost don't want to see it. Like I almost do not want to see it. Just to, a, a child actor personifying the uh, Tony's pain It'll might be, be too much for me. Yeah, yeah. It'll be a hard watch, but I, I agree. It, I think it's necessary. Um, mm-hmm. It's the. It's the. It's going to be what gets you invested. Like it's the moment that you invest and say. I'm in it all the way. I have to see how you know how this is going to turn out. Yeah. Um, and I and, and I we said this too a little bit. And I know we I know we were signing off, but you know this idea that they need to take that time with it because e- even these two chapters we sit with so much discomfort in what is really a short amount of of space. These are these are two pretty short chapters, and yet mm-hmm. the pain in these chapters is just you know it's wrenching. And I feel like that's right it's mm-hmm. it's you know and 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 you hate to say it but it's the kind of pain that you need to feel um and i hope that they do that but but as always visualizing something right seeing it is very different than than reading it right so i do also agree with you travis it's going to be devastating to see yeah yeah so. well thanks so much everybody for listening and uh, we will talk to you next week Bye-bye. Have a good night.